Welcome to Art Talk. I'm the host, Laura Beldovs, here at Cedarburg Public Library. And today we are talking to our current exhibiting artist, Kathleen Flaherty, who is a local Cedarburger and also a member of the Cedarburg Artists Guild. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so so pleased that you invited me here today. Yes, we we love that Cedarburg has so many artists residing here and and all you know want to give an opportunity for everyone to show their work and show off their work and and have people that might not live in Cedarburg get to know our our residential artists. So um but I read somewhere that you actually originally did not, your career was not arts. Right. So tell us a little bit about that. What what were you doing before you became an artist? Well, I grew up in the mid-century, mid-20th century, mm-hmm. and our choices back then, I can remember my mom sitting down with me at the kitchen table saying, well, now it's time for you to decide what you want to be when you grow up. Mm-hmm. And you have two choices, a nurse or a teacher. Yes. Truly this happened. And we're just amazed in today's world that this could have happened. But I loved kids. I used to play being a teacher all my life. So I knew that was where I wanted to be. And I've, I've never been sorry for, for uh, choosing that career. So I do have... Um, I do have my master's in education mm-hmm. and uh, have been just blessed with so many wonderful students over the years. Started out in West Dallas, and then um, Jim was transferred to Philadelphia. So we spent 10 years out there where we had our children, our three children. And um, in between all that going on, I always managed to be taking a workshop and art workshop. I just grew up loving art. Right. And so, yes, that my career has been in the classroom, mainly first through third grades. And um, uh, back in the 90s, I went to Cardinal Stritch and picked up my reading teacher license because we had returned from Philly. And uh, I knew they weren't going to hire... Uh, someone with all the experience I had, unless I had a little niche. So I just really enjoyed my time at Stritch and earned that reading teacher license, but always was on the lookout for the next art fair or who's doing what and what's um, what could I do this summer with my summers off, which was real handy for when I started doing plein air events in the year 2000. So... Yes, I've had quite a lengthy career. And then I homeschooled my own children for 21 years, a whole length of time there before I went back to teaching in the 90s. So what, um, So you talked about how you were an educator and always taking these uh, art class mm-hmm. workshops um, mm-hmm. to keep your toe in the water. What kind... What, what made you finally transition from teaching to to the arts? Oh, golly. Well, I always, I'm just a lifelong learner, and I just so enjoy gleaning information from other people. And um, what made me decide to retire, <laughs> uh, I was 70 years old when I retired from te- teaching in the classroom. That's and a long I, time. And, and it was... Well, yes, um, 22 of them in classrooms, Mm -hmm. and then 21 more with my own children. My youngest actually went through all the years of, she chose to to remain, to work right through, and um, we kept a portfolio and the credits and this and that, and showed it to Cardinal Stritch when I was up there doing my reading license, and they said, we want her. So they gave her a scholarship, and that's where she ended up in her senior year taking uh, college courses. So it's been quite a wonderful experience, but I was ready to retire when I was 70 Mm -hmm. and thought, now I can really dabble in my art and enjoy it. And that was 20, that was 2015, And I had um, participated in the plein air events Mm -hmm. that 
the Cedarburg Artists Guild sponsors every year. Well, they started that in 2000, and I was right there with the rest of them, but I was a watercolorist Mm -hmm. at the time. And uh, just enjoyed myself so much. But if you know watercolors, when you're finished with that painting and you have to turn the painting in, you need your mat, your glass, your frame, and then you have to pray that when when you're framing that up, there's not a black fleck on the mat once you get it all together, and then you have to take it apart again, use the hair blower, mm-hmm. blow dryer, and blow it off again, and it's just pretty tricky. And I was, it was the year 2003, I will never forget this, and I was still doing my watercolor in the plein air events, which is we invite 150 artists from all over the nation to join us in that event, outdoor event. And it was the year 2003, and an oil painter was standing like, oh, three feet away from me doing her own painting. And she's finished with her painting, takes her frame, and goes flap, and pops it in the frame, screw, screw, gets her wire on, turns it in. And what am I doing? Slugging away in the back of my van (laughs) Mm -hmm. with mats and glass. And that's when I chose, okay, I'm going to get more serious about this and uh, learn how to oil paint. So my it took off in another direction. But it, it was great to retire and have this door open for me. So um, for those that don't know what plein air is, what, what is plein air painting? Well, it's, it's the French Impressionist's um, word, phrase, for outdoor painting. And... Um, It has caught on like wildfire, I would say, since the Mm mid-90s. Back in the 70s and 80s, I would go outdoors and paint, but nobody had coined the phrase, the plein plein air. air, And uh, honestly, it is the biggest movement in the art world, I think, for this century. It's just amazing. Yes. All the events that are popping up all over the nation and internationally. So have you have you gone to other places to do participate in the plein air events? I have, but I really want my art to be just something I enjoy, love doing, and I don't want to turn it into a job. I've had that my entire life. And I look around and there are people who wonderful artists who this is their livelihood and they go from one event to another to another i stay local Mm -hmm. i've done the plymouth plein air and i've done um cedarburg almost every year i go up with the uh, invited artists to the door county plein air event Mm -hmm. um, each year for the last three years and they invite other artists to join the invited artists for the very last day. And that's always exciting because it's a two-hour time limit that you have to do with with painting your painting, and then you have to turn it in. Oh, that's a, that's well, a lot of pressure there. It's a lot of pressure. We used to have that invent, event uh, incorporated in our plein air, also here in Cedarburg, but the last few years we've chosen to do... Um, the event of Fresh from Cedarburg, where it's all in the historic community, and and we have about a day and a half that we can paint for that. And yes, it is a lot of pressure, Mm -hmm. but it it was fun to do, too. And then the winner, the the invited artists get to uh, vote on who they would most likely want to share a gallery space with, and they would vote on the, the best... Um, of the novices, or you might call us. We're still professionals. We sell paintings, but uh, mm-hmm. they vote. And then that person is invited the next year to be with the invited artist. So it's a very exciting event. And I, it just so many artists from all over will go up to Door County and participate in that. You mentioned that since uh, this is not a J-O-B for you, um, it must then free up your choices of what you want to paint. What what kinds of things that 
are you drawn to in these plein air events to paint? Oh, I really am drawn to architecture. I've done many of the buildings along Washington and um, Washington Street. Um, just, I love reflections. That will really turn me on. And I've, I've been known to stop my car, get out, take photos, or sit in my living room, and all of a sudden the sun is beaming in, and, and there's in my bay window, there's all these shadows and a vase of flowers that are just casting a gorgeous shadow. Get out my, my camera or just set up my paints and paint it. So it's like whatever the spirit moves, but I am drawn to architecture and reflection. That's so fascinating that um, you you are drawn to reflections and maybe uh, how glass is translucent as well and mm-hmm. and maybe distorts the the object behind it. Yes, how you can look at a vase of flowers and where the stems are going into the water, it's like abstract how right. it's disconnected. And then when it hits the water again, there's a little bit of a distortion mm-hmm. between the two. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned that uh, you've done watercolor and you switched to oil. Um, do you have a favorite medium, or do you like them? Do you like them equally the same? There's nothing like watercolor. The magic of that paint being on really good watercolor paper arches, mm-hmm. three hundred pound, or. 140. It's just it's just magical how those colors can blend. Sometimes I would be painting and look at my painting and then look back at my palette and say, I want my painting to look like my palette. I mean, just how mm-hmm. all the colors are intermingling and creating new shades and values. It's it's such a fun, magical medium. But also with um, oil paint, oil paint is more forgiving. So you can layer, you can make changes, um, and, and you can make it be a thin medium, whereas it can mimic watercolor also. With a wash? With washes, mm-hmm. getting your oil paint thinned out more, yeah. So how did you first start learning watercolor? It's, it's a pretty tricky medium to master, I would think. It is, and I've had wonderful mentors and workshop instructors. Uh, I think I started taking it more seriously when I lived out in Philadelphia. And I started, my boys were just babies and toddlers, and I just needed a little time for mom. So I would use that as my excuse, great excuse. And Dominic Stefano was one of my first instructors long back in the 80s and learned so much from him wonderful watercolorist and then when i moved back in the mid 80s to the, the to the Milwaukee area jean crane was wonderful at sharing her knowledge with us too um when i switched over to oils back in 2003 i saw it out the best of the best, Tom Knockreiner from out in the Waukesha area. I think I've taken five or six workshops with him. And he and these teachers, they turn into friends, and they're just so willing to share their knowledge with us. So it's, it's been a really nice journey. Mm-hmm. So um, along this journey, do you feel that this your art has a purpose? Oh, yes. I do think my art has what, a purpose. What does your art mean to you? Well, like I said earlier, to me, it was a way to calm my spirit. Uh, so it was relaxation. It was pure enjoyment, um, keeping my brain sharp, learning learning new things and testing them out, and kind of an escape, just like a good book. Mm-hmm. is a great escape. So was painting for me. Um, yeah, it's definitely using another part of your brain mm-hmm. when you're looking at 
things and transcribing it out, out onto paper and to color. Yes, yes, it was a lot of fun. So do you think um, artists still have a role in today's society? You know, historically, you know, artists were commissioned to paint paintings for religious reasons. Um, you have your more decorative artisans that would make more practical things. But today, in today's society, with everything being kind of... Um, uh, marketed towards obsolescence, do you think artists still today have a role to play? Oh, very definitely, I do. Uh, I I wish I could remember the artist who said this. Artists take the ordinary and make it extraordinary, and I don't know what computer can do that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's and you could line up ten different artists. And each one of those artists would see something differently and place it on the paper differently. There's just nothing that can take that uniqueness away from the artist. So, yes, I think it's here to stay. Mm -hmm. And I think artists help shape society, the culture of our society. Um, They produce a record of our surroundings for future generations and certainly express emotions. Yeah, it's been very interesting to see how younger artists today are doing a lot of um, mashups of taking from bits from different uh, cultures, different uh, styles of arts. Um, and this is also in music and in fashion, um, how, how now that because of the internet the the world is so much more accessible mm-hmm. that they're able to take these different pieces and create something very new. And isn't that remarkable mm-hmm. that they are doing this? Yes. I, I think that's great. All kinds of expression are acceptable. Right. Mm-hmm. I like I really love that and it's it's really fun to see how they interpret all these different things and make something of their own. Sure. So so when um when you were teaching, did you find that you your the art side of you, did you find that it influenced your teaching in some way and how did it do that for you? Well, I think it had a a great deal of influence on my classroom. Um, There was always color, and I've just made sure there were a lot of art projects uh, connected with whatever social studies we were doing or science we were doing. Any time I could have an excuse to bring in the paints, Mm -hmm. um, I would, and then display. Whoops, excuse me. Displaying the children's work mm-hmm. uh, was so important. Um, so I think it had a big influence. Um, Marie Montessori was one of my go-to people, and she just believed thoroughly that we need to immerse the child in the environment and have a rich environment around that child, not necessarily um, chaotic but just a rich environment for them to choose materials and have it be from their own heart what they were working on. Yeah, I understand that the Waldorf School of Teaching is similar in that, that they incorporate a lot of natural objects into their curriculum and Mm -hmm. um, encourage uh, students to go. They actually have classes out in nature Mm -hmm. and learn about nature and... Um, you know, because it is very much a part of our world. Right. And Wisconsin, I think, is third in the nation for the most Montessori schools. Oh, wow. That's, mm-hmm. that's There's one excellent. down on Brady. Mm-hmm. There are, and my own Catholic church is incorporating Marie Montessori in our Children of the Good Shepherd program here at St. Francis Borgia, which I'm going to take part in, so it's going to be very exciting. We're starting that up for three- to six-year-olds this this fall. Oh, wow, that is very exciting. Mm-hmm. So, uh, will the classes, um, are they all day long? or are they They're just catechesis classes, mm-hmm. so they're going to be held 
uh, one day for an hour and a half. And um, we have about, in our, we call it the atrium, and the children go in for... uh, for their time with the with the guide, we're called the guide or the facilitator, and um, there probably are fifty or sixty dioramas already in place for the children to choose from and to work with. They could be practical life dioramas, and the whole community is participating in this. We have carpenters making the dioramas. Um, so that the small child who comes into Mass every Sunday can know, well, what is the priest doing up there? So they're going to have small dioramas that replicate this, and they'll learn the names, the chalice, the patent, you know, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I just finished um, my sixth full-day workshop with Ellen Schlosser in Menominee Falls to learn how to demonstrate these. And so, yes, it's very exciting, that hands-on learning. So you mentioned um, Marie Montessori Mm -hmm. as an educator and some of these other mentors in the Philadelphia area and Milwaukee area that uh, got you started off on your art um, career. Um, Who else has been very uh, influential on your work? On my work? Well, or on, on your journey doing art? I have a group that gets together. We used to get together at least once a month. Now it's kind of phased out a little bit with COVID, but we're coming back together. But there were 11 of us that would gather, and we would have um, critiques. So just being with colleagues who also paint Mm -hmm. and sharing our ideas and then evaluating and giving suggestions that's yeah, been so beneficial so getting together i would recommend that for anyone who's out there listening to really gather with people of like minds and and they don't necessarily have to paint the same way it's often better if we all have a, we do have, all have our own way of painting but um that's been very instrumental. The Cultural Center here in Cedarburg has been phenomenal support for our Cedarburg Artists Guild and what we, and now Cedarburg Art Museum also. I mean, we're just so fortunate, aren't we, in this mm-hmm. community? Uh, who else? There's probably, oh, I belong to the League of Milwaukee Artists. In fact, in the year 2000, to 2005, I think it was, that I was the president, but I was on the board for about 11 years. And uh, the colleagues that I met through that, I mean, they become good friends and, and such support. So, yes, there's been a lot of support along the way. So do you practice, do you do any kind of daily practice or... Um, you know, some artists, they do a sketch every day or a tiny painting every day. Oh, my gosh, I sure wish I was like that. <laughs> <laughs> I am, um, well, first of all, art is quite a solitary mm-hmm. activity. And that's, and I am Miss Social. I just love to be with people and interacting. And um, so for me, plein air came along at a great time because golly it's having all these artists together and sharing ideas and painting together uh i am not a real solitary art person so my dining room right now is kind of my gallery and uh studio combined uh, and it's been set up for two days for me to paint. I have uh, this Covered Bridge Art Studio tour coming up in October. Yes. And, um, golly, I have things to do, so I should be home right now painting. But I, so I struggle with that. Mm-hmm. I want to be social and do things that I'm interacting with people. Mm-hmm. And it's harder for me to settle myself down. I applaud the artists out there, and there are many of them who get up in the morning and they paint, and they have, and they can do that. They just set everything else aside. I'm not that way, and I said that from the start. This is enjoyable for me, and I, when I do it, I love doing it, and I, I thank goodness that I really um, have some skill that I can 
manage to sell a piece or two every now and then, but I'm not, I'm not that structured, nor do I want to be. Well, I've discovered that um, many artists have different ways of mm -hmm. working. And actually, a couple of years ago, I bought a book for our library. Um, the exact title escapes me right now, but it's basically um, the author uh, interviewed some current artists and also read, uh, did research on other female artists throughout history to see what was their daily routine like or what was their artistic process like. And he discovered that uh, women, there were women artists that worked only in the evenings and late into the night. There were women artists that were also mothers and uh, would incorporate art and child care taking in their day. Whenever they had a, you know, mm -hmm. a few minutes, they would do something and then there were artists that were uh, had periods of time where they did nothing. And then all of a sudden, they went through a very productive period where they produced a lot of artwork. And, um, and then they would go through another follow period. So, um, so there, there were all these, you know, there, you have this stereotypical image of this artist who's feverishly working in their studio and... Um, and cranking out all of these artworks, but um, in reality, there's many different ways of right. producing that artwork. And there are times when I'm feverishly trying to get something accomplished mm -hmm. that, uh, the, okay, it's under the wire, I have to have this done by X, or when I take on commissions. I remember one Christmas I had like five commissions, and I'm going, oh my gosh, I don't know if I'll do that again. Oh, you yeah. know, because then it does. It, it's, uh, I love doing it, and I, I'm just honored that people want my painting hung in their home. I mean, golly, what mm -hmm. a joy that is. So anyway, um, I would suggest to listeners that um, if you're interested in learning more about different artists, um, Eric Rhodes has a wonderful podcast and he interviews an another a, a different artist every week so his it's eric rhodes r h o a d s and i I've, I've learned so much through that and you're right there isn't one way to do it and not a wrong way either so right, right. yeah there is, there is no wrong way it's whatever works for you mm -hmm. So um, I read somewhere that you were the artist in residence at the Cedarbury Cultural Center a couple of years ago. I was during the month of March. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what did that involve? Well, when you're, uh, when you're uh, invited, you are, you're kind of contracted to be there certain days. You can choose the days you wish to be there. And you can set up your work. They have a workstation, and you have wall space to hang your paintings. And then uh, toward the end of that month, you um, are also contracted to uh, teach a class. So I taught one on beginner plein air. And that was a lot of fun. With I think I had eight, or eight to ten students in that class. So yes. And it's really an it's an honor when our my community asks me to join their company for whatever purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and then you mentioned that you are getting ready for um, in October uh, covered bridge art studio tour. Yes. Yeah, so, what does that involve? Well, three of us: Tom Kulik. Um, Betty Rubner and myself will be at St. Francis Borgia School for um, three days, uh, 8th, 9th, 10th, I believe, are the dates. The brochures are all over town, uh, and you can go to Cedarburg Artists Guild, uh, dot com to go to the events and then choose CBAST, which is the acronym for Cover Bridge Art Studio Tour, and it will explain the dates, and um, the brochure is fabulous. Lynn Ricks and Candy 
work so hard on this, and they have so many supporters from businesses all over uh, that support it. And um, great big bro- six-page brochure with, with a fold-out map, and it's a three-day event, so you can grab a friend and just enjoy visiting all these studios that are now opened up to you, and artists are demonstrating their work. Uh, so it's it's just a fun, fun time. And another main event, we have four main events through the Cedarburg Artist Guild. Oh, what are the other events? Well, I chair the Holiday Art Fair, mm-hmm. which is going to be the 3rd, 4th, 5th of December. And um, the um, AJE, which is our artists, members of the Cedarburg Artist Guild, will be showing their work at the Cultural Center um, at the end of this month for, I don't know how long, a month, maybe two months, I don't know exactly the length of time. I don't have that in front of me. But, uh, so that's... We have the AJE, we have the uh, Cover Bridge Art Studio Tour coming right up in October. Then we have our Holiday Art Fair at the Community Center. 36 artists are going to be joining us there with their fine arts and crafts. And then we have our wonderful plein air event in the summertime, in, in the first week of, usually the first weekend of June. Okay. Well, that's a a lot of arts here in Cedarburg. It is. It is. We're pretty well supported here, and we appreciate all our patrons of the arts. Well, I have to thank you, Kathleen, for coming today to talk to us about your artwork. And uh, for those of you that are in the area here in Cedarburg, uh, Wisconsin, Kathleen's artwork will be on display in the library until September 15th, 2021. And after that, we'll see her artwork at the Covered Bridge Tour. That would be nice. I'd love to see you there. Yes. Well, thank you. And uh, until next time on Art Talk. Bye. Bye.